because music can cleanse and heal us and touch our souls with a positive energy. Yeah, yeah. Music was the ancient medicine because first there was the word and the word was sound and the sound was love and the universe picked up the riff and scattered along behind singing go baby, blow. And we're lucky when the harp man takes center stage because then we dance in the light of his singing soul. All right, this is a little short thing called Blues for the Ladies. A jagged piece of broken glass hung in the sky. If someone had cut the sunset stroke tonight, the blues singer died. We sat and cried, and the moon hung in the sky like a dead purple rose. The night that Billy stopped chipping, a craft band did a drag step dirge through a slack jaw herd. And blue angels watched with burning eyes, and night we carried sweet us to home. And Janice dropped like a golden note, and jammed her blues into her, jam, her blues jammed her soul into our hearts, our minds, and night her needle got stuck. Okay. And a jagged piece of broken glass hung in the sky because someone had cut the sunset's throat the night the blues singer died. All right, here's one I wrote for the uh, the blues festival we did last year. It's called Sunlight Blues, blowing smooth through the cool gray olive trees. Martin leaned against the long bricks, listening to his main man Luther lay his line. I won't say a woman, but if I ever seen, she treated me like I was a king, I treated her like a doggone queen. But little Junior, holding two shiny quarters in his sticky brown fist, wobbled his two-year-old shuffled over to the snow cone machine. The moon was half past full and shrinking down when we gathered in the park to dig the sermons of squirrel and friends, metaphor, and the shri sheep were preaching. When Oroville threw a party in the sun, all the city officials climbed onto their grand horses and issued the proclamation, Blue's power is going to rule the world! And the star on Sonny's turban sparkled as the music rose from the stage and mingled with the barbecue smoke of the celebration, the festival, the good rocking down home happy feelings. And that day, we all sang the blues on B Street. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we can kill your scars if they need it. No. <laughs> you got a wide angle lens, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Can you add one dessert? How about a little piece of pie, Ellen? Three <laughs> more. <laughs> How about two? What kind of pie you got? Pussy. Oh. <laughs> I'll eat a whole one myself. <laughs> I don't know. Where I just want to sit down there. Oh, God. 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 Who's I need a clean glass. Brother Mel, Mel. I don't want to hear it. I don't. I don't. Oh, I oh, forgot to put my earrings in there. That works good. Very much. Draw all the film. What do you need? This one. I need a slice of it. Ellen the molar. Give us the molar. She's a molar? We just had, um... What is there? It's just a table wine. We went to the wine country about a month ago. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,
Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what room. I tell you, my brother was a little more. Is that the one that you met down there? She was the tour guide. I think that was the one. Oh, yeah. I don't want to let her back. I sent her this big invite. I don't want to let her back. And she goes back and forth. She goes back and forth. I don't know what I'm not. John, you want to have that really money? That's it. Like mm -hmm. I'll take it. I, so much, which made it I don't know. Probably in New Jersey. Restaurant owners and managers. Oh. Last weekend at the ABM or last Monday at the ABM. Not, you know, no employees. You know, people from the outdoors. How much you want? Just having to teach us about the wine and try and sell them to us. And so it was so nice to be able to go in there. And ask intelligent questions and uh, discuss with them and compare. I, know, I did a lot of comparing of different wines from different wines. We do learn a lot about a lot. Uh, one of our waiters is a wine salesman for that is the winery and he makes a turn on the rod. He's, he really knows a very, very, very knowledgeable about wine. <laughs> <laughs> Could you get this hat here for you? I'll cover my face though, okay? <laughs> I think they're going to know. It's a one-of-a-kind one dress you got on. We'll know who's in there. Such an amazing hat. <laughs> um, you know, when you do the thing with the legs of the wine now, the, the, the longer it takes it to go down, you just like... Excerpts from... Amadea del Arte by John Barbado. How I Found Law and Order in St. Neville, California, or The Case of the Stopped Up Toilet. Prologue. When more dirty hippies moved into the already overcrowded tenement slum of St. Neville, the toilet wasn't able to cope with the extra shift being transferred from the dirty hippies' bowels to the overworked septic tank. And the hippies were finally so affected by the sweet stench of sour shit they were left with no alternative but to telephone their kindly redneck landlords, Clark and Giselle de Kent, at their humble tract home somewhere in Fresno and request the assistance of a sewer cleaner. Ever vigilant, the Kents quickly dispatched one Joe Scumsucker, U.S. Army, retired. Once in charge of cleaning all the Pentagon's latrines, a job that required nerves of steel and a nose of the same. One day, Joe had pumped some particularly vile shit and lost his guts and resigned his non-commission and since started a little septic tank business of his own. He mainly pumped civilian shit, but he occasionally still did a few top-secret shit jobs. Joe would remark, Hell, civilian shit is a lot richer than military shit, but it ain't half as gruesome. So the Kents gave Joe a call he couldn't refuse. He strapped down his Smith & Wesson police special, fired up his shit truck, and went over to the said hippie slum. No sooner than he got there, he was attracted to attack by the filthy hippie's trained killer dog, Bubbles. He almost blew its head off, but the hippies pulled a mad dog back into the house. Joe almost lost a piece of his ass, but luckily he was wearing baggy crotch chino pants to save. He was scowling at the hippie pukes and wondering why God would let this kind of filth shit like normal people when he noticed the convocation of demonic revelers fornicating in the garden up near the tomato plants. And as he reached for his heart pills, he detected the presence of the evil, evil killer weed marijuana growing near the same said tomato plants, and he immediately understood what had possessed these devil worshippers. His better instincts told him to just shoot these bums and whores, put them out of their misery, save them from themselves, but his military training prevailed, and he decided to trust the great American judicial system to protect him from these godless creeps. On or damn close to August 11th, 1978, Lieutenant, officers Lieutenant Fred Pay and Inspector Lionel Coyote apprehended one Jimmy Dirty Fingers Nails Almapura, a known greaser of Sicilian antecedents. What follows is Alma Pura's drug-addled confessions at the time of his arraignment, 
in the hallowed chambers of the Tukwila 3rd Judicial District Courthouse located behind the frosty trees. In the little corrugated building with the untrimmed window and the broken wind and the untrimmed lawn and the broken window. They were going to tidy the place up, but they remembered that justice was blind, so what the fuck anyway? The confession. <clears throat> I did it, Your Honor. I admit it all. I've been smoking dope within the confines of the United States of America. I've been high for the last 12 years, and that fact alone has made me assume a sort of nonchalance about it. A lid costs 50, 60 bucks nowadays. It's probably crawling with paraquat. And with the dope money I save, I can buy more booze and cigarettes. So these reasons made me come out of the closet and willfully and unlawfully germinate 16 seeds. Ah, oh, hell, let's be honest, Your Honor. I germinated 26 seeds, but the veil of life's illusion was ripped off of ten of the little fuckers' faces for they're even a month out, and they, like I said, croak. I admit it, Judgey Pie. I've been loaded since 66, and you can see the ravaged waste of my once strong and powerful brain as they dragged me in here, or as the proper word, drugs. The way I'd slobber, and mucus would drip from my warty and vulgar nose onto my shackles and chains was enough to make a decent citizen vomit. They are correct, Your Holiness. Those noble bastions of decency, Lieutenant Pei and Inspector Coyote, to deliver me from that foul demon's clutches. I mean, I had sunk so low as to plant my pot amongst the clean, hard-working tomato plants, like it was a perfectly natural act or something. Those tomato plants, who just a few year, hundred years ago had been illegal themselves, had worked pretty hard to clean up their image and had risen to a respectable position in the planting world. And now here I was trying to drag them down into the sordid mire I've been wallowing in so long. But I didn't care a fig about them decent vegetables, Judge. I just blithered along each day with visions of starry galaxies exploding in my feverish brain like some spaced out color TV set. I admit it all, boss. I cared for those sixteen malicious herbs with all the love of a mother duck, leading her brood across the farmyard, quacking and shitting in self satisfied glee. I'd cover those evil stalks with the finest ten mil plastic available to protect them from the killing spring frosts. I'd fertilize them with a regularity approaching religion. Water them at exactly the right time with a pure and hand-warm mineral water solution brought from secret springs only us users would get to. I was in bad shape, Doc, that fateful day when those two shiny 78 Polaris cruised up the driveway and I knew the jig was up. I've been sitting there in a stoned-out trance, reading, reading William Buckley's succinctly Brahmin and breaded witticisms when the heat arrived. I recall it like it was last Tuesday, a long time ago for us veteran users. And I was sitting there, buck naked, swilling the brew and having just ingested my after-work treat. It was bag through all the way. Suddenly, the man pulls up, dressed in a pressed sports jacket with over-large pastel checks. A light blue arrow shirt, maroon tie, matching belt, underwear, shoes, and socks. He's kind of teddy bear cuddly with gorgeous little blonde mustache and, and wispy blonde locks going bald in that sexy way little fat middle-aged man guy. And he was polite as pie, your grace. Even though it was a hundred degrees out and he was sweating like a Yorkshire at rut, his diction was perfect. Good evening, sir. We're here to inquire about some plants that might be growing on the prison. My beady little criminal eyes darted frantically back and forth, and I hunched up in a rat-like posture and nervously started to, to lick my paws and clean my whiskers. Just then old Inspector Coyote ambled up completely at ease, Sancho Panza to the pudgy lieutenant. Old Lionel looked like a strung-out chill wills, lean, hard-drinking 48-year-old wearing love beads and Jerry Garcia sunglasses as cool and worldly as a truck driver from Manteca can hope to become with a kind of TV cop show morality and compassion for his catches. He fishes around in his wallet for his Miranda card to read me. If I wasn't so paranoid of, of doing a Lenny Bruce Wacko freakout and ending up being carried off down the corridors frothing and spewing legal ease, I'd shut down this riff and make it out to the library and look up the exact bullshit old Lionel was fixing the spout that I am. But before Lionel could get it out, I copped him a whole can of smoked oysters. Oh, kind sirs. You must, must mean the ones up in the garden, I whimpered. Oh, now, God damn it. Your Worship, I forgot to tell you, I just slipped on my old ragged-ass cutoff before I came outside, so I was at least covered genital-wise. 
Now my old greasy prick that had been scarred and tempered in thousands of encounters with the opposite of quivering sex during the ten-year sexual wars of orgiastic equality wouldn't have been those two godlike and angelically endowed cops who hovered over me like some kindly older brothers and who now endeavored Pat Boone's style to save me from that so oh so heinous crime against society, self-gratification. I flash back to the time I was caught beaten off by my parish priest, only instead of throwing me in the jailhouse like these cats did, he sucked me off, which seemed just as bizarre a scene, but much more enjoyable all around. If the good old lieutenant and his Watson had taken a page from the annals of the venerable father, he would have smoked a joint of my stuff or taken half the stash for themselves, which they probably did, or even just sucked me off. I would have felt sufficiently chastised for my base and ignoble desire to willfully, unlawfully, and maliciously farm pot. But you, you sweet ship and benevolence, the voice of greater bureaucratic reason prevailed, and the giant computer in Washington, D.C. was offered up another tender soul to dumb over and worry. I'd almost made my peace with this fucked up system, your foppish immigrants. Not finding any better ones, life is life is life, it's dog eat dog food world, you know. Having made all these compromises, we assume as we get older and more gravity bound, it kind of mellowed me out. Being high helped for sure, but as the wise officers discovered during the interrogation, I wasn't quite playing the big game correctly now, was I? Did I have any credit cards? No. Did I even know what a mortgage was? No. How many cars had I purchased during the last 12 years? Mm -hmm. Well, there it all was in stark black and white. Contribution to society? Why, well, I stood accused clean as detergent. I hadn't done a goddamn thing for the state since they let me out of the army back in the bloody 60s except pick a few measly spring beans out near Bakersfield once and father a bunch of brats to keep the social workers employed. Uh, it was a sorrowful record. I figure the least you'll do is revoke my social security card and issue a number to a more deserving citizen. Just look at my job, for Christ's sake. Your Honor, here I am, out in the woods, eight hours a day, working for the feds as a forest technician, your holiness, in charge of a crew of tender, impressionable 18-year-olds, corrupting their morals and performing various acts of ground squirrels too unmentionable to be uttered inside these sacred halls. And I wasn't even chopping anything down. I wasn't, I wasn't burning manzanita. I wasn't logging or thinning pines. I wasn't even polluting the air with one of them stupid little home light songs. I wasn't doing a single chapter of things. Just what in the hell did I think I was doing out there anyhow? My whole crew could pass through an area in ten minutes after we left. We couldn't even tell we'd been there. Is this, I ask you, proper and respectable behavior for a true and decent American? Fuck no, man. It makes a goddamn Sierra Clubism. Creeping namby pamby pathicism of a misguided and perverted overlove of the earth instead of an unquestioning belief in the domination of mankind over all else in the universe. Your most exalted omniscience, I admit it all. I smoke the vile weed, and I stand naked, except for my cutoffs, and admit I'm guilty before this most knowing and august tribunal. I only ask my punishment be swift and sure as a samurai sword stroke, and let he who is most straight be the first to get stoned. Yeah. That yeah. qualifies as an import, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's an importer from Fairfield. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it won't Mike have a job in port. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, buddy, what, you want me to go make a quick run for you? There's beer in the fridge there. Oh, there is? Yeah, yes. I mean, Matt. Hey, Matt. 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 Yeah, yeah. Matt. Yeah. Matt. Yeah. Matt. Yeah. I would, I would take that. Okay, well, Matt, we'll pick it. Matt, Matt. I'll get you a new one. I dropped that one. Matt, he says, make mine my food. Our house sleeps on its side with its knees, with its skirt over its knees. Our house lies on its side and whispers quiet little snores out of its mouth, like a lady in a movie on a couch, satiated with bonbons and benedictine. The dwarf tiptoes around the old girl and tickles her ribs. At night, our doorknobs twitch. We watch windows go up and down. Terence has a red cane that floats across the room. In the kitchen, huge, moldy sausages make queasy speeches. Our house turns gray and grows a long, wrinkly trunk. During the heat, 